Jesus taking the judgment, the silent lamb, the shorn lamb, the slain lamb, the sacrificial lamb, the precious lamb whose blood had taken away Philip's and the eunuch's sin. So what I'm saying to you is, Philip guided the eunuch to Jesus by a kiss too. It was his love for Jesus that made Jesus real in the scripture time. Philip didn't know any theology, he just knew Jesus. And if you study those two little pictures, you'll see the church business contrasted with the church. You'll see that the church's business is not to give a hypocritical kiss in public, draw nigh with their lips and their hearts far from him. The business of the true church, brethren, is not by theology to convince men in their minds that they ought to believe like us. It is by the pure love of Jesus make manifest the precious Lamb of God who died to take away our sins. Now, if the church is not a building, and it's not an organization, and it's not a family you can join, then I want you to hear this, my brethren. If it is a bride, it is not the servant of Christ. Go into the church organization and all you will hear to prod you along to your Christian duties is that Christ is your master and you're the servant. And if you do not serve the Lord, the master will deal harshly with you. Is that not true? And in all of those passages from the kingdom gospel are quoted, and our duties and our responsibilities and our obligations to this stern taskmaster who called us to be his servant, are laid upon us, and we're made to knuckle down and serve the church and do church works because serving the church and doing church works is the only way that we can truly serve the Master and Lord because in our theology, the Master and Lord and the church business are both the same. Well, I want to tell you here that that is a lie. The true church is the bride of Jesus Christ. He didn't come to earth and in his death, burial, and resurrection seek a servant. He had a hundred million servants in the heavens. They were called the angels of God. Ministers, ministers, fiery ministers who could do anything God enabled them to do and anything God empowered them to do and anything God wanted them to do. If he'd wanted more servants, God would have made him a few more. He wanted what heaven didn't have and what heaven couldn't make. He wanted what only could be created and only could come to life out of his riven side. He wanted a part of himself, for himself. And he came from heaven and died on the cross of Calvary and descended into hell. That God in the surgery of Golgotha might take from his precious side a part of him and make for him a wife. We're his bride. Oh, we're not here to serve him. We're here to love him. Oh, well, if you love him, you'll serve him. Well, don't get it bass backwards. Going to church business, you hear 99% serve and 1% love. And when you hear the 1% love, it will always end up saying the same thing, serve. How would you women like to be married to a man who walked in your presence every morning and he said, Listen, wife, don't give me this love bit. Certain duties here you took on when you became my wife. And I want my house clean. I want my meals fixed on time. And I want my clothes washed and ironed. And I want the kids taken care of. And I want the floor swept. And I want this done. And I want that done. And when I get home at 5 o'clock, if it's not done, I'm going to beat you badly about the head and shoulders. And if you don't continue to do it, I'll get a new wife. Because so don't get any ideas about me marrying you just because I loved you. I married you because I needed a housekeeper and I needed a servant. That's what a lot of women have in their marriage. How do you like it? You don't like it, do you? No. That's what marriage is all about. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. The man who has a wife who loves him, he never even has to think what he wants. He never even has to think what his desires are. She's one with him. She knows what he wants and what he desires and what he yearns for. And she does it because in doing that which makes him happy, she has made herself happy. And in seeking his joy, she's found her own. You agree to that? 
Well, you have to agree to it in theory, even if you don't know that it works in practice, okay? So the churches talk about working for the church, and that's why they're always talking about bringing in the kingdom, and that's the reason why they're always concerned about bringing back the king, and the true church is not working to bring in the kingdom, and they're not looking to bring back the king because they have the bridegroom now in their hearts by the Holy Spirit, and they're waiting on his appearance to take them to heaven for the marriage supper, and the kingdom will just take care of itself whenever and if ever that works out. And let me begin to close this message. Well, what are we going to do with all these churches? What's the answer to them? <clears throat> well, let me tell you what the answer is not, first of all. <clears throat> Every place I go and in the mail at the book room, I get requests from people who say, pray that God will revive the churches. I want to tell you, it would be easier to revive the golden calf that the Egyptians built in the deserts than to revive the church organization. Now I'll tell you why the churches can't be revived and why they never will be revived. And you people who are praying for revival in the churches, if you're thinking of the organized church, I'll tell you why you are wasting your time. Every revival, quote unquote, that begins in any church organization in the spring or fall or summer crusade or winter follies or whatever it is, begins with a message on praying for real revival and praying till revival comes and they go back to the Old Testament and quote this verse, if my people which are called by my name will confess their sins, if they will humble themselves, if they will pray, I will answer out heaven, I'll pour out blessings they won't be able to contain. And they pray and go through this same ritual on this same verse every spring and every fall and just like the prophets of Baal who cut themselves and shrieked and cried from daylight till dark and God never even answered the telephone they never get any answers and God never showers out his blessings and if there is something that they report as blessing it's always in numbers or in dollars and after the numbers and the dollars have increased they are just as spiritually dead as they were before you can't revive that which is dead. And here's a point I want to make, and I want to get all this in this message this morning. I may not get to say it again. The church organization, the churches per se, never did have life. Hear this statement now. It is not that the churches were good at one time and they have just lost their goodness. It is not that they were hot at one time and have just cooled off. It's not that they were alive and now are just sick. It is that they were always dead, and they are dead, and they always will be dead, because organization has nothing to do with the organism of Christ's body. And you just as well try to put Christ back in Christmas as try to revive the churches, because Christ was never in Christmas and he's never been in church organization. You study the word revival and you'll find that it's an Old Testament word. You'll find it common in the vocabulary of Samuel and Asa and Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah and people like that. And you'll find that they did pray for revival and you'll find that God did give revival, but they were a living people. But let me tell you something, you'll find that every revival that ever came in the Old Testament was a very temporary shower of blessing until the time, in the fullness of time, that God sent forth his Son, destroyed the whole system, and established a new one. You say, well, God did use the churches at one time. God never did use the churches. His Holy Spirit labored among men in spite of the hindrance the churches put in his way. Organized church was never the instrument of God. It has been from the day of the Tower of Babel the invention of Satan, the counterfeit of the true church of Jesus Christ. I don't care who knows that, because that's the truth. It's the mystery of iniquity. And I'll tell you something else that's not the answer. Let's get the devil and the world out of the churches. You just well try to get the president out of the United States. Because the devil runs the church business. 
It's his territory. It's his kingdom of darkness. It's his place of delusion. It's his realm where he is the uncontested head. You'll never get the devil out of the church business, and you'll never get the world system out of the church business because they're both one and the same. What needs to be done is get the saints out of the world system. Get the saints out of the kingdom of darkness. Get the saints out of Satan's counterfeit and make them walk in the reality of the church they belong to and the union which they have which is real with Jesus Christ. Somebody told me the other day, they said, well, I don't believe everything you say about churches. I think we have a good organization. We have a good thing going here. What we really need is a new preacher because this preacher in there has messed things up. Isn't that a common complaint? If we just get us a new preacher, everything be fine. Listen, you send off for a preacher, you just well order one from Sears and Robot. Because when he's delivered, I'll tell you what you get. You get one of two things. You'll either get a hireling or a fraud. You know why? Because the mafia is running the church organization. I'm not talking about the literal mafia. I'm talking about the spiritual mafia. I'm talking about the mystery of iniquity. Any man who can be elected to a congregation to serve him for pay is not the servant of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying he's not saved. I'm just telling you he's kidding yourself when he's pawning himself off as a servant of Jesus Christ. Those who serve him are the Lord's free men. There's no mafia of New York City or Chicago who gives them their orders. They don't report into any head, you know what, at the convention. They don't get their orders in the mail on Monday morning. They don't send triplicate forms back to report what's happened this week. They don't measure blessing in numbers and dollars. They preach in the power of the Holy Spirit, let the pieces fall where they do, and let those who can be saved get saved, and let those who reject, reject. They've got nothing to build, they've got nothing to sell, they've got nothing to join people to, and nothing to proselyte them from. They've got a gospel to preach, good news to proclaim, the truth to share with everybody else. That's what you'll get if you order a new preacher. You'll get yourself a fraud posing as a minister of Christ, or you'll get a hireling who will sell his soul for his paycheck on Sunday night. Well, then the only answer is, I think we ought to start a new church. I want to say this. I, I'm saying what I, you know, I've been accumulating for years. Do you know that there are very few people who have really seen the mystery of iniquity as professing Christianity. And I'll tell you how I know there's very few people who really have. is because every time people in a church organization get a little bit of light, their first thought is, let us go build a better church. I tried it. I went this route. And it was because I had never seen the mystery of iniquity for what it was. It took a long time. In fact, it took almost 13 years in one of the soundest, independentist, fundamentalist church in this whole town. I started an independent, fundamental, separated, premillennial, book, blood, blessed, hope, missionary, orthodox, evangelical, and everything else that you could put on to separate myself from the church business. And I found out 30 days after I started it that I had just built myself another Sodom and that I was, in essence, in the same confusion I'd always been in and under the same darkness I'd always known. And I want to tell you something. Every independent fundamental church in America is populated mostly by disgruntled church members, but not by true believers who came out of apostasy seeing the mystery of iniquity. Hey, I can start a new church in anybody's town on any given Monday morning and have it full in 30 days. Because there's enough disgruntled church members running around the town, all I have to do is find out what disgruntled them and go around and honk a little bit on those things and I'll have my building full, right? I'll run around to Baptist and, and I'll say, I say, brother, how come you left the church? And they'll say, well, I left the church, you know, because over missionary giving. And I don't believe in this kind of missionary giving. I say, brother, you need to be in our church because we don't believe in that kind of missionary giving either. Now I go to the Methodists and and say, why'd you leave the Methodist church? He said, I left because they don't believe in the security of the believer. I said, brother, I believe in once saved, always saved. Come to my church, I'll preach whatever it is and make you happy. You can fill up anybody's building in 30 days with disgruntled church members. The world's full of them drifting from church to church like a bunch of tramps.
going from east to west and north to south, listening to every Tom, Dick, and Harry comes down the religious pike, and every time they sit down in the new hall and listen to a new speaker, they go out there saying, the truth at last, the truth at last, they wouldn't know the truth from a bale of hay. Disgruntled church members. We have some right here in the assembly that have been with us for years and years, and I call your staying here True Grit. <laughs> True Grit. Now, hey, let me tell you, there's a difference between just being disgruntled with the church business and seeing the church business for the hypocritical, pharisaical, self-righteous, satanic system that it is. I put the test on you people here in this hall. When your neighbors ask you, what church do you go to, what do you tell them? I say, well, I tell them to go to Union Hall. When they ask you what the name of the church is, what do you tell them? You say, well, we don't have a name. If they ever ask you this embarrassing question, why is it that you do not go to an organized church, what do you tell them? I know that some of you tell them this. Well... We don't really have to be organized and have a name to be a church. We just call ours the assembly. And instead of having church building, we just meet in the union hall because we're poor and we can't afford anything else. And, 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 and what I think you really try to do is pawn off the assembly to be just like any other church, a rose that smells just the same you just prefer to come to church here. Some of you show up because it's church time. Some of you show up because it's time for the morning service. So what I'm saying to you is that some of you, God took out of the church business years ago, but some of you have never had the church business taken out of you. And if it hadn't been for the diligence of the Holy Spirit in the ministry and in my life, You'd have made an errand out of me a long time ago and given me your golden bracelets to build you a calf. And you'd have made a priest out of me, just like the church people have made a priest out of their preacher. The reason I'm not your priest anymore is because I came to the place where the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me anymore. And he just made the man die in your eyes so that you don't have any incentive to make me your priest anymore. I thank the Lord for that. Now you'll either find him or you won't ever find anybody. Well, why then does the churches prosper if it's so bad, as you say? Why is it they're all full? This is interesting. I told a man one time, and he said, Well, I don't care what you say, God's blessing our church. And I said, Well, I'd like to hear more about that, because that's news. That's the first time in history it ever happened. How do you know God is blessing your church? Well, he said, we started out, we had 30 people, now we got 400. I said, okay, and how else do you know God's blessing your church? Well, we started out with a budget of $20,000, and now our budget's up to a quarter million dollars. How else do you know God's blessing your church? Well, when we started out, we just met in that old store building down there, and now we got a brand new church, it's all paid for. Well, how else do you know God is blessing your church? And then when they get real pressed, they whip this hard one on you because there's souls being saved. How do you know there's souls being saved? Well, because people come forward and accept Christ. How do you know that coming forward is accepting Christ? Well, you're getting ridiculous now. No, I'm not getting ridiculous because I want to tell you something. A church organization that preaches the truth will not be a church organization very long. Do you know how I ended up in this God-forsaken place called the Union Hall? I made the silly mistake of preaching the head. And I kept on preaching and magnifying the head till one day the Holy Spirit said, you're going to have to put a body on that head before long. And I discovered the body in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and I began to preach the truth of the body of Christ and to preach myself right out of the church business. And I preach most of you right out of the church business. I hope now to live long enough to preach the church business out of all of you that's here. Oh, no, the blessing of God. Hey, if that's the way you want to measure, who do you think printed more gospel, quote-unquote, literature last year than anybody else in the country? Jehovah's Witness. 
You talk about the money increase being the blessing of God, go ask the Roman Catholic priest how much money the Roman Catholic Church takes in every year. Go ask the Seventh-day Adventists who practice and preach tithing how much money they took in last year. Go visit your neighborhood Pentecostal, fire baptized, Holy Jordan River, uh, apostolic, uh, saved, sanctified, and ain't going to sin no more and got the gifts of the Holy Ghost and spoken tongues. Go visit them and ask them if God's blessing their church and they'll say, oh, praise the Lord, the Spirit's here, the Spirit's here. Hey, the church organization is not under the blessing of God, it's under the deception of Satan. And the church has already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies, and we've been seated there where we are now presently enjoying them. You say, what's... How come people fill them up then? Well, honestly, I, I don't talk to a lot of people who go to church and who belong to church, and they're sick of church. Really, it's true. They're sick of it. Up to here in it. They're so miserable that they can't hardly stand it. They're so sick they can't hardly make it from Sunday to Sunday. They crab and complain and criticize and condemn. But they go back like alcoholics to the booze, like a drug addict to his needle. They're hooked. They have to go back to the empty tomb, though an angel has told them that he is not here, he is risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Why are they hooked? Because they are people who, having never known that one mediator between God and man, need a priest they can see, need one they can touch, need one they can ask questions to and get an immediate answer, need one who will sit down and put his physical arms about them and comfort them with his physical words. Having never known the reality of the invisible Lord Jesus Christ, they are desperately in need of a priest who will assure them that if they do what he tells them to do, be what he tells them to be, everything will be all right with God, and he will make it so. They go back week after week after week after week because they can't make it outside the camp. They can't bear the reproach of being outside the camp. They can't bear the thoughts of not being a part of some great organized spiritual thing that they are sure, because so many people say they're sure, will be in heaven someday. They can't bear the reproach outside the camp because they have never known the sweetness, the peace of being inside the veil. They go back because they need the dead works of the religious world to keep their conscience salved enough so that they can sleep at night, somehow be buried in the church when they die, and at last gain a home in heaven with you all. Read the book of Hebrews and see if I lie not when I tell you that religious works are born of a conscience that's never been purged with the precious blood of Jesus. One man said, I'll never be back to the assembly begin again because there's nothing for me to do there. And if I don't work for God, I'll backslide and be lost. He was more honest than most of the people. The church business, let me tell you, it's tantalizing. It's tempting. It beckons. It calls. And there's a peace and the quiet and the comfort of sitting there in that sanctuary listening to those things we must do and trying to be what we are told we must be there's something that puts the conscience to sleep and sends the soul to hell they're hooked on the church business because they need the law they've got to have the law and the traditions and the rules and the regulations whipped on them every sabbath quote unquote day because they have never known the grace of God. If some priest is not there to tell them where they have failed and how they can succeed, they will never be able to reform their lives and make the flesh look like the Spirit and Simon to look like Peter and a devil to look like Saint. They need the rules and regulations of the church business so they can score themselves so they can judge themselves by themselves, 
so they can say I'm either walking a straight and narrow or I'm not I'm either in fellowship or I am not well I give you lots of reasons but I know this sound men who've been healed don't need crutches anymore and deaf men whose ears have been opened throw their hearing aids away and blind men drop the white cane and the tin cup and never beg again when their eyes have been opened by Jesus well are you saying they're buying the churches is unsaved no I'm not I'm saying that the system is rotten to the core I'm saying that the system is corrupt and I'm saying that the men who control the system are corrupt and rotten and I'm telling you that Satan is behind the whole thing just like a government's corrupt and rotten too just like the men in political office are controlled by the rot rotten and corrupted system that put them there that's why you'll just get nothing but a carbon copy of what you fired if you send off to Sir and Roebuck for a new preacher no I'm sorry to tell you that there are saved people mixed up in the church organization I'm telling you that some of God's saints who belong in the true body of Christ and who are in the true body of Christ and are in ignorance of where they've been placed in the heavenlies and what the true church is all about are still being raped and ravished by the church business and the simplicity of their faith in Christ spoiled and ruined and I mean to tell you that they're working their fingers to the bone and giving their pocketbooks to the core for a system that's going to go up in fire someday when he judges that great harlot and that great whore who sits on the seven mount city and made this world corrupt with her daughters of fornication now that's telling it to you as plain as I know how to tell it to you you say well, what are you going to do about all them saved people that are in the church business I ain't going to do one thing with them but I'm going to testify to you as I close this message I was born and raised in that system if there was ever a man who believed in it one time with all his heart you're looking and listening to a man who did right when I went into the ministry in 1948 I thought the denomination of which I was a part had to be the most holy sacred perfect organization on the face of God's green earth I took their ordination certificate with a pride that I shall never forget and to be called their son in the ministry was a thrill that I won't soon forget and I started out to preach the gospel that had saved my soul and preach the word that had been revealed to my heart and I hadn't preached the gospel for six months until I was in so much trouble I didn't know where to look until I was beset upon by the powers that be in my denomination like a bunch of ravening wolves they came down upon me like a pack of dogs and they said you will do as we tell you to do or you will not do it at all within the confines of this organization you will preach what we tell you to preach or you will no longer preach you will serve as we tell you to serve you will be what we tell you to be and I begin to find out what every president that gets elected to office you know finds out when he sits down in the old room in the White House and looks around and says hey I'm the president I'm the smartest the biggest the most powerful man in the world and about that time out from beneath the woodwork comes the powers that be and says hey you ain't nothing but a stool pigeon and an instrument and we who put you in this office will tell you what you must be in this office now this is the facts of life stick your head in the sand go to sleep if you want to I'm gonna live this life to find the truth that's what the church doing is all about I found it out early I got the message and I said well if I can't preach here then I'm in the wrong church I'm in the wrong church organization I just took off like a you know what kind of a bird and I found me a church organization believe what I believe and I said boy I got it made now because all these people in this church organization believe just like I believe now and I can just preach with all the freedom with all the liberty I want to and I hadn't started preaching but just a little while and I was in the same kind of trouble smelled the same and I said this is where I come in all I'm telling you is there's nobody believed in the church organization like I believed in and I said okay the answer is start me a church that's better than everybody else's that's like Lot moving out of his house into the house next door so I started me one and I said I'll keep my house clean and I swept it and I garnished it and seven spirits more wicked than the first came and took possession of it
Oh, well. The Lord didn't leave me. He didn't leave me. He said, I will never, no, never leave you, nor forsake you. But here's the point I'm making. He led me out. O-U-T. You Christians in the church business, you miserable, wretched, unhappy, dying from the lack of joy, people who are working yourself to death for a system you know is wrong, you are entitled to all of the unhappiness and the misery you can enjoy and stand. He led me out just like he said. There's a shepherd who leads his sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And he said, get out. The ship's going down. And when I got out, the people who stayed on the ship said I was a deserting rat. But I want to tell you something. Rats don't mind living while the rest of them go down with a precious ship. And I'm still out here floating around. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins. But don't come out unless Jesus calls you out and you hear his voice and you come out not to the assembly, not to the union hall, not to some other group, but you come out unto him without the camp. Make sure you come that way because you have to come knowing that Jesus is enough. You come to this hall very long, you get tired of this old dirty American flag over here on the wall, and this one hanging up here. You get tired of that old Pepsi Cola machine and, and uh, some of these outdated calendars and these dumb pictures on the walls. You get tired of those hard metal chairs. It won't just be enough. Well, it just won't be enough class, you know. You'll miss the pipe organ. You'll miss the soft lights. You'll miss the padded pews. And you'll miss the intoning of the service. And you'll miss the responsive reading. And you'll miss the cantatas. And you'll miss the program and the excitement and the ladies' aid and, and the king's daughter's class and the young people and the boy scout. And you'll miss all the activity and all the fall de -roll. Unless you have Jesus, you just won't have enough here or any place else. But I promise you this, if Jesus is all you want and Jesus is all you have, you will never, 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 never be disappointed. Because when that blind man ended up on the sidewalk, he found Jesus in a way he had never known him before, walked one-on-one -on -one with him in a living fellowship. Stay as long as you can as long as the people will let you and as long as the Holy Spirit will let you. And so when somebody pins me down and says, why don't you belong to an organized church? I like to give them this answer. Now, I'm about to finish. Be patient with me. I've already lost some. They walked out. Uh, I'm about to finish. When somebody says, why is it that you don't belong to an organized church, my answer most of the time goes like this. And I throw this out to all you people in Tapeland, all you pastors, listen to me. If Jesus came to your town today and walked the streets in human form like he did in old Galilee, as you like to say, I ask you an honest question, sir. What church in your town would he join, become an active member, contribute to, and thereby dedicate his loyalty and works and fellowship? Now meditate on that before you answer. Because if you're a Baptist and you say, well, I'm certain he would join my church. Let me ask you another question. Would you have the guts to ask him to join? You don't hesitate to ask anybody else, but would you have the brass to walk up to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is head of his own church, and ask him to join yours? Yes, most of you would. <laughs> now you ask for me honestly, would he join your church? Now think before you answer, because if you say yes, you are saying that Jesus Christ would associate himself with your church organization in a way that he would be announcing to that whole town, if you want my fellowship, you have come to this building get it. All my service, all my works, all my fellowship 
and all my presence is going to be in the confines of this church organization and this physical property. And the rest of you people in this town, if you're Christians and you want to be with me, you just have to come over here and be in this building and this organization with me. That is, in essence, what every true born-again believer is saying who belongs to a church organization who dedicates their talents, their abilities, their money, their time, and their presence and their fellowship to it. And there isn't any Christian who's honest who could say Jesus would do that. He would not. I'll tell you the answer. He wouldn't join anybody's church. He wouldn't join anybody's church. And if you're honest in your soul, you know. I have one more question for you. If Jesus wouldn't join your church organization and grace it with your presence, his presence, his fellowship, his time, his money, his ability, and whatever, what business do you have in it? That's a hard question. Face it, though. What business do you have? Would you want to be where he would not be? Do you want to contribute to what he will not contribute to? Do you want to build up what he will not build up and serve what he would not serve? Satan offered him the kingdoms of this world. What has he offered you? Well, thank God. Thank the Lord I'm out of church business and I'm safe and sound right here in the assembly. Because we're sure different. I remind you, assemblyites, that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they hadn't gone very far till they'd corrupted Aaron and built themselves a calf. And they worshipped around it and said, This is the calf, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And I have notes which I made to myself 13 years ago, and the Lord said, Watch for these things. Don't just move out of one church into another and just call yourself the church of no church building. Don't ever refer to yourself as the only remnant on the earth. Don't ever be caught up in the fact that is prevalent in the religious world of just changing the face and the outward appearance of the same rotten business and pawning yourself off on an unsuspecting public. I repeat again. We have all come out of the church business, but the church business hasn't come out of all of us. And like Lot, who was delivered from the city of Sodom, and I'm going to talk about that tonight, he begged and cried that God would give him just a little city that looked like Sodom so the world wouldn't know he'd really depart. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this message, for your truth. Yes, Lord, we know. This message ain't going to do us any good out there in the religious world. And we know the rocks are going to be bigger and heavier and more of them this week than they were last week. And I know that the reproach that we've experienced so far is going to get greater and greater. And you know, Father, I don't care. Oh, Father, just, just keep on. In the power of the Holy Spirit, giving each of us the courage and the boldness to just tell it like it is. Time is too short, Father. And we believe that you're visiting your people in a special way now. And one of your main concerns is to get them out of this awful harlot. That the bride might make herself ready. Now, Father, you can do with this message what you want to do with it, and you can do with me what you want to do with me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.